What makes a hockey player great? What makes a football player great? What makes a soccer player great? What makes a cook great? Isn't it all the same thing? The results, right? A great hockey player is the goalie who stops all the shots or the player who scores all the goals. A great football player is the one who throws the most touchdown passes. The results, same for soccer. The cook, great cook is the one who has the best recipe, right? What about faith? What makes faith great? Is it the same as for the hockey football player and the, uh, and the cook? Great faith is one that gets results. You might be tempted to think that way after hearing this account of the centurion's faith. Because Jesus calls that faith great, right? And you look and you say, he got pretty good results, right? He got his servant healed. It's tempting sometimes to think that, right? to associate a strong faith with results or a weak faith with results. My mom was sick. I prayed for her to get better. And she didn't get better. Did I, was, was it because I had a weak faith? Or you put your concern on God's altar. Your concern about that job. Your concern about your health. And you prayed about it and prayed about it. And you got the job. You got better. Was it because you had a strong faith? As we look at this account of the centurion's faith, we're going to realize great faith has nothing to do about results. But it has everything to do with attitude. Stop and think about the centurion. Right? He's a, a Roman soldier in charge of a hundred other soldiers. Right? He's got a problem. He's got a servant he likes, loves, and the servant's about to die. So he does what we'd expect, right? He heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews asking him to come and heal a servant. Now that doesn't seem unusual, does it? Jesus is going around doing miracles, including hearing people, so when he hears of Jesus, he sends for him. But if you lived in the Jew and Greek world of that time, this would have caught your attention. Because Jews looked down on Greeks and Romans. Yet, what do we find these Jewish elders saying about this Roman soldier when they went to Jesus? This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. This Roman Centurion really made an impression on the Jews. So much so that they went to Jesus and said, he deserves to have you do this, Jesus. You ever have that attitude as a Christian? God, you deserve to do something for me. Maybe you're thinking, Pastor, no, I don't. I know that I'm a poor and miserable sinner like we confessed. I know that I have needs and I come and I bring them on God's table and I just leave them there. And you know what? That's what I thought too. When I was studying the sermon text, I asked myself, do I ever feel like I, I feel like I'm worthy or deserving of something from God? And at first I thought, no. But you know what? The more I thought about it, and the more I thought about the big concerns that have gone through my life in the last 10, 20 years, the ones, you know, the ones I'm talking about that, that frighten you, that grip you with worry and anxiety, and you put them on God's altar? Well, as I thought about that, you know what I realized? I realized I wasn't always happy with the answer God gave me or when he decided to give me an answer. Have you ever had that happen to you? You've had big concerns, scary concerns, worrisome concerns, something you laid at God's feet, but you weren't really all that happy with the answer you got or when you got that answer. 
When we're feeling that way, aren't we really acting as if we're deserving of God to be good to us and answer us? And that feeling or thinking us can just get bolstered, right? Like for the centurion when everyone was saying how worthy he is. Well, when, you know, Linda says what a great husband Steve is, or your kids say what a great parent you are, or your friends say how you're loving and caring, and you say, oh, Pastor, that was a good sermon. It's easy to start thinking that, well, I am worthy as a Christian. I'm a good Christian, or at least I try to be a good Christian, and I'm worthy of God to do something nice for me. Back to the centurion. He does something really surprising, doesn't he? When he now hears that Jesus is coming to him, now he sends some of his friends to Jesus with this message. Lord, don't trouble yourself. I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That's why I don't even consider myself worthy to come to you. Somehow the centurion must have got a whiff of what these elders told Jesus. That he was, this man's worthy, Jesus, for you to come. And I can just imagine the centurion going, No, that's exactly what I didn't want you to say. Because I know I'm not worthy. You see, this centurion was a devout believer. In Jesus. Otherwise, he wouldn't have gone to him expecting he had the power of God to heal. And he knew as a devout believer, there's only one way he could be worthy before God. And that is if he was completely perfect. And he knew he wasn't. He knew he was unworthy. I remember a, a chapel, preschool chapel I did in spring. I don't know what the Bible the Bible story was. But I remember asking the, the preschool kids sitting in that front row, I, I said, why do, you, why do you love your mom and dad? And they came up with the typical answers you'd expect. Well, they make meals for me. They take me to things and do things for me. In other words, they love mom and dad because mom and dad do nice things for them, right? So then that was the perfect follow-up question to say, well, why do your mom and dad love you? <laughs> well, what are they going to say? Because I do good things for them? No, they didn't say that because they knew they didn't always do good things. So you know what they said? Well, they're supposed to. <laughs> right? And, and it's true. And isn't that a perfect picture of us and God? Why do we love God, Jesus? Well, what has he done for us? He's given us bodies and blessings and everything we have, and then he's given us salvation, forgiveness, life eternal in heaven. He's done nice things for us. Why does God love us? Not because I'm worthy or you're worthy, but he's supposed to. That's what he does. That's what makes a great faith, isn't it? It starts out with just realizing I'm not worthy. I am unworthy before God. The, the centurion realized that, but guess what? He realized one other truth. As much as he realized how unworthy he was, that didn't stop him from fully expecting that Jesus would do good things for him by just saying a word. Lord, don't trouble yourself. I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. That's why I didn't even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. Tell this one, go, and he goes. That one, come, and he comes. Say to my servant, do this, and he does it. This centurion got it, right? I'm sure Molly has the same thing with the National Guard. You say a word, and the person under you has got to do what you say. Well, if that's how it works in the army and the military... Isn't it even more true with the almighty, powerful God that he could just say a word and it would be done? Go back to what you know about creation from Genesis. Think about Genesis chapter 1. Time and time again, what do you read there? And God said. Right? And God said. And then you get, let there be. Three words in our English, but that's just one word in the Hebrew. And what happened? Let there be light. Boom! 
Light all over, which is impossible for us to live without. Let there be, boom! There was planets, there was stars, there's water, there's oxygen, there's ground, there's trees, there's animals, there's fish. So often, we want proof, don't we? God, give me proof that you, that you exist and I'll believe in you. Give me proof. Satan would love for us to think we need proof to believe in God. Do you remember the account of the rich man and Lazarus? The rich man ended up in hell because he did not believe in God. And he's there in hell suffering, but he's worried because he has five brothers who are still living on earth. So you remember what he asks Abraham to do? Abraham, send Lazarus back from the dead to them, because if they see him, they'll believe. Do you remember Abraham's answer? If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, that's the Old Testament, the Word of God. If they don't listen to the Word of God, they won't believe in God, even if someone comes back from the dead. Martin Luther wrote a book called The Small Catechism. Catechism is just a word that means teaching. So he wrote it because Martin Luther realized, as we're trying to, Dan and I are trying to emphasize with Family Night, if you want your kids to grow up in the way of the Lord parents and get to heaven, then you have to realize your primary responsibility to bring them up that way. In other words, Jesus and God and his word has to be modeled and talked about by you with your kids. And then also the church assists you. So Martin Luther, to help fathers do that and mothers do that with their children, he wrote a small teaching book. Having all the main teachings in there like the Ten Commandments, creation, baptism, the Lord's Supper, and prayer. Here's what he said about baptism. He asked the question, after telling that baptism actually can wash away sins and create faith in a little child, he said, well, how can water do such great things? Then he answered the question by saying this, it's certainly not the water that does such great things, but God's word, which is in and with the water, and faith, which trusts this word used with the water. For without God's word, water is just plain water, not baptism. But with this word, it's baptism, the gracious water of life and washing of rebirth by the Holy Spirit. That's proof that God exists. And that's how God comes to you and me through the word. It's the word that makes baptism not just tap water, but it makes baptism something powerful that forgives sins and creates a miracle of new faith inside an infant. It's the word that makes bread and grape wine, not just bread and grape wine, but Jesus' real body and blood, so you can have no doubt that every one of your sins is forgiven. It's God's word that made the confession of sins we did this morning more than just a personal guilt trip for each of us. But it's the word of God that made that confession of sins into a powerful, wonderful reassurance that every one of my sins are forgiven. God has forgiven every one of your sins, it said, right? It's the word of God that makes me more than just a talking head, this service more than just some entertainment. It's the word of God that makes this service a time when God comes to you and reminds and declares to you the wonderful things he's done. That's why I wear this robe, so you don't focus on me, but on God and his word. If you think about it, a great faith, Really, it's like Jesus said. It's a childlike faith, isn't it? Think about a little, little child. I mean, they believe their dad can do anything, don't they? I remember when I was tiny, I'd ask my dad, Dad, why aren't you president? Because he could just do that if he wanted. Dad, why aren't you quarterback for the Green Bay Packers? He could do that. He could lift anything. He could do anything. You know what I'm talking about. You felt that way. Well, isn't that exactly the kind of faith the centurion had? 
He, like a little child, realized he couldn't heal his servant. He couldn't do anything. But Jesus could. His Heavenly Father could do anything just with a word. So pray for that childlike faith that, that, yes, realizes we're not worthy of any blessings, but that is confident that God can give you whatever you need with just a word. So what do you need? Is it, is it assurance of forgiveness for that sin that you're having a hard time forgiving yourself over? Or is it to have that guilt removed that you have? Then go to the Word. That's why you're here. Go to it at home. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What is it that, that worries you? Is it going to high school? Is it something about your kid's life or your life? Well, then go to the Word. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink or what you're going to wear. God's going to take care of all those things, right? Are you, what are you afraid of? You afraid of the end of your life? Well, then go to the Word. Jesus said, whoever believes in me will live, even if they die, right? And the list could go on and on and on. The Word. Trust it and what it says in childlike faith because he says it to you so you can personally own those promises. Amen.